One of the questions I often get asked after people read Virus Mania is, okay, it seems that a lot of these alleged viral diseases don't add up and germ theory has major inconsistencies, but what about chicken pox parties? You know, the ones our mums would take us to as soon as some poor kid in the neighbourhood came down with the illness. Wasn't it a highly infectious virus that was passing around and you could get it by simply being in the same room as a case? In fact, one of the people that asked me about chickenpox parties was my friend Germ over at Germ Warfare. Make sure you check out his amazing work and fascinating guests over at germwarfare.com. So for Germ and others, let's dive into chickenpox and see if we can find any evidence of a virus and what took place at these parties. In 2019, an article appeared in Forbes written by Bruce Lee, and no, I'm not talking about one of the most influential martial artists of all time who passed away in 1973. This Bruce Lee states that he is a writer, journalist, professor, systems modeler, computational and digital health expert, and his article was titled, Why Chickenpox Parties Are a Bad Idea. The idea of a chickenpox party is that children are deliberately exposed to someone that has chickenpox in the hope that they will catch it and then have a mild case of the disease from which they fully recover and develop lifelong immunity. But that went out of favour. In 2001, Dr Paul Donoghue wrote in the Lewitz and Sum Journal that chickenpox parties are a thing of the past. The doctor reported that chickenpox is so highly contagious that one exposure all but assured that the well child would come down with the illness. It was sort of a crude vaccination. In response to a reader's question about the safety of the recently released chickenpox vaccine, the doctor goes on to say that chickenpox is not a perfectly harmless infection. It can cause pneumonia, brain inflammation, Ray syndrome and even death. Later in life it can come back as shingles. After dialing up the fear factor, he goes on to conclude the vaccine is safe and effective and every child should have it. What did you just say? Nothing, just had a little deja vu. Back to the Forbes article and Lee goes on to lambast then Kentucky Governor Matt Bevan for his comments on chickenpox. In a 2019 interview, Governor Bevan stated that every single one of my kids had the chickenpox. They got the chicken pox on purpose because we found a neighbour that had it and I went and made sure every one of my kids was exposed to it and they got it. And they had it as children, they were miserable for a few days and they all turned out fine. Now Lee doesn't seem to like it when people take personal health matters into their own hands and once again the fear factor is dialed up as he points out all the terrible complications including death that can result from chicken pox. He doesn't provide any data related to this, although does admit that the risk of severe complications is quite low for a healthy child. However, he concludes that all roads lead to vaccines for every child and finds it hard to believe that anyone can't agree with his logic. Particularly as just a year earlier, he had advised that everyone should be getting the jab and refers to the CDC as his trusted source of information. It makes you wonder who supports this guy's vaccine mania. Anyway, over at the CDC they state that chickenpox is a very contagious disease caused by the varicella zoster virus. They go on to state that before the vaccine was available, about 4 million people got chickenpox each year in the United States. Over 10,500 of those people were hospitalized and about 100 to 150 people died. That equates to a fatality ratio of about 0.003%, with other estimates actually half this. And although I'm not dismissing any deaths, even on their own figures, chickenpox is clearly not a significant cause of death. Now, I tried to find out where the CDC were sourcing this information, particularly with this claim that varicella is the causative agent, but the links provided seem to just take you round in circles and back to the CDC homepage. I headed over to medical pharmaceutical propaganda site, Wikipedia, and with regards to the claim that chickenpox is caused by the initial infection with varicella zoster virus, the reference cited is the CDC page. 
uh, the familiar pattern of trying to find the actual original evidence for these virology claims. It appears that throughout the chickenpox literature, the same claim is made that the disease is caused by the highly contagious varicella virus, but nobody cites an original paper where this was established. Another tactic is to make a claim such as initial infection with VZV results in chickenpox, which is typically seen in children one to nine years of age. But the reference only establishes the second part of the sentence regarding the epidemiological patterns rather than proving the causative agent. Time to look at my 1991 copy of A History of Experimental Virology by Alfred Graff. The textbook states that the varicella virus is the causative agent of chickenpox, but disappointingly doesn't provide any backing evidence. Elsewhere, the 1925 experiments of Karl Kondratitz are cited as proof, but conclusions regarding a virus from his work are pure speculation. I obtained a translation of his original experiments, which are not that well documented. It involved taking fluid from zoster vesicles and then introducing it into the skin of 28 children through small incisions. He states there were positive vaccination results in 17 children and negative vaccination results in 11 children, referring to skin reactions. It is not clear that any of the children developed typical chickenpox, and he only mentions observing slight increases in temperature in two children in one experiment. In any case, the experiment was done with fluid that contained all sorts of things apart from alleged variants. Injecting foreign fluids and proteins into humans can cause skin reactions and other problems without requiring a virus. Secondly, it did not demonstrate the so-called highly infectious nature of the condition where we are told up to 90% of non-immune contacts become infected through airborne or skin contact. Not one of the children got ill that way. In fact, the fluid had to be injected into their skin, and even then only some developed the rash. So it's not apparent to me that there are any original scientific studies demonstrating that the causative agent of chickenpox is a virus. The next step is to look at papers purporting to describe the isolation of the alleged virus. But here we find that the virologists are up to their old tricks again because they are not able to directly isolate any viruses from an individual with chickenpox, they resort to tissue culture experiments in test tubes. In this example, they bomb the mix with antibiotics and then passage the brew, i.e. keep stressing the cells multiple times. When the cells showed cytopathic effects, as you'd expect when treated so badly, they declare that the virus from a patient specimen had done this. No control experiment was done, so it's not particularly scientific. The paper goes on to report that the virus they claimed was in the brew did not survive freezing at negative 20 degrees. But again, they are playing with a tissue culture and admitted to perform the same test with a tissue culture minus the alleged virus. The problem with these kinds of experiments is that they do not demonstrate that there is an actual virus present. The methodology of the experiment itself can produce the findings without introducing a virus into the equation. And even if you believe the methodology is valid, there still needs to be another step in the process to meet the definition of a virus. Any claimed viral-like particles produced in the laboratory need to be purified, and then these particles by themselves need to be shown to be able to infect a new host and cause disease. After all, we are informed by all the health authorities that it's a highly infectious virus, so it shouldn't be too hard. In the present day, the CDC advises that PCR of skin lesions is the most sensitive method for confirming a diagnosis of varicella. Hmm, the PCR, the method of amplifying genetic sequences hijacked for diagnosing infection. It doesn't tell you that you're sick, and it doesn't tell you that the thing you ended up with really was going to hurt you or anything like that. I won't get into further detail regarding the use of the PCR for alleged viruses and infection as I've covered it in several of my other videos. Suffice to say, all the PCR does is amplify genetic sequences. That's it. It's not really a test. So why do we see outbreaks of chickenpox if it hasn't been demonstrated that it's a viral infection? 
Well, outbreaks of disease don't require an infectious agent because often the individuals involved are exposed to the same environmental conditions simultaneously. For example, factors involving the climate, nutritional states, psychological stressors, and innumerable factors that we remain oblivious to. I'd also point out that empirically, I've seen plenty of cases where only one person in a household gets chickenpox, including when there are several other children in proximity. Dr. Tom Cowan and Sally Morrell have postulated that perhaps the skin vesicles that appear with the illness do transmit a signal to surrounding people. While this probably sounds odd to mainstream belief subscribers, we only have to look at menstrual cycle synchronization with the moon to see some of the mysteries of the universe. It is interesting to see that this lunar synchronization has possibly been broken for most women through our modern lifestyles. Back to chickenpox, and Cowan and Morrell put forward the hypothesis that some childhood illnesses may be a phase we go through rather than an infection per se. They point to research that has identified that febrile childhood diseases seems to be associated with lower risks of cancer in adulthood. So worse long-term health consequences may develop if we interfere with this developmental process through vaccinations. And on vaccinations, you might say, doesn't the chickenpox vaccine contain live weakened virus? How did they make the vaccine if there might not be a virus? Well, just like cell cultures are not proven to contain viruses, vaccines can similarly have constituents that are not true viruses. What is being injected is various proteinaceous nanoparticles said to be viruses, and these antigens will cause an immune reaction. Now, the CDC has produced a chart claiming the remarkable success of the varicella vaccine that became widespread in the US from 1996. Firstly, these mortality rates are per million people, so we are talking about very small numbers here. Secondly, it appears that mortality rates were already trending down prior to the introduction of the vaccine. Thirdly, if you look at the tiny number of mortalities, two out of the three children that died between 2012 and 2016 had severe underlying diseases such as leukemia, and one out of those two had been vaccinated. Fourthly, to achieve these results, tens of millions of vaccines needed to be administered to around 90% of kids. And lastly, it doesn't take into account the costs and potential problems that may have been created. Because the vast majority of people are at no risk of death or serious disease from chickenpox, vaccination risk is even more concerning. With regards to varicella vaccination, it has become apparent that it can cause shingles in young children, a debilitating disease that is usually only seen in adults. We also know that typically less than 10% of vaccine adverse reactions are reported, so it is likely that many other kids who would otherwise have been fine ended up with iatrogenic health problems. And as Tom Cowan has suggested, are we just swapping one problem for an even worse health outcome later in life? In 2019, Children's Health Defence also outlined their concerns about the safety of the varicella vaccine, including how the FDA approved it without long-term safety data. Echoing McFarlane Burnett's 1966 paper, Men or Molecules, where he warned about the potentially erroneous conclusions being drawn by molecular biology, I'll finish with a 1991 quote by microbiologist André Michel Loif. Today, virology is in danger of losing its soul since viruses now show a strong tendency to become sequences. Moreover, and it is the direct result of an abundance of discoveries, the very concept of virus wavers on its foundations. Our problem today and in future is to keep abreast of its whereabouts. To help sustain my channel in this time of censorship, please support my work on Subscribestar. Link is in the description. So that we don't lose touch, please find me at drsambailey.com and sign up for my free newsletter.